As secretary, you need to be the best you can be. This group of women whose voice was not being heard. There's something you can do about it. Everything exploded. The movie was married to a movement. They built their own kind of feminism, and it was powerful. I'm not just a secretary. I'm a secretary. Well, hi, everybody. And um, Elise and Angel, it's great being on this panel with you. Um, the first time I saw this movie, I... Um, I was pretty overwhelmed. Uh, you know, it had a lot of my friends and comrades from decades of organizing together. Um, I thought the filmmakers made us look great. Um, and th the work that we did was important. And I was saying um, to Angel and Elise before we went live, uh, that when you're doing the work, you're not really thinking about, are right. you, are you impacting history and so on and so forth? And really seeing that movie was the first time I thought about that in the same way. That you made history. Mm -hmm. Thank it was you. part of it. So next generation organizer, Angel, what, was your, what, what came to your mind when you saw the film? You know, I was surprised. I think that there, I, you know, I, being in, in the workforce at a different time, it, it's, it was, I was like, what did they make you do? What were they, what were they saying? You know, like, um, I think that that to think of something like that happening not even so long ago, right? Um, and the the different experience that I have as a working woman, um, it was it's kind of jarring. Um, I, it, it was uh, eye opening. Thank Made you. me feel intense gratitude for the women um, in that in that film. Thank you, sister. We're standing on the shoulders of some really strong. I, I really am. Yeah. I felt sucked back in time. I was just like. <laughs> Oh, the time machine and things that I hadn't, that I've forgotten about, the, the, the atmosphere, the dress, the, the language, and being a clerical worker. And I was fired for not making coffee. I was, she, my, my, the woman who worked in the office, she was, she'd been there for years, she was senior secretary, and she said, if you don't want to make coffee, you can't work here. And you're trouble. So that was in that, but that, that wasn't the end of my clerical career. I kept going. So what, if anything, do you think we can learn from the past in watching this film and hearing the story told that you lived through, Debbie, uh, and that you're living through now, Angel, as, a, as an organizer? What can we learn from the past about organizing today? You want to go first, Angel? OK, Angel, you go. You know, um, one of the, the lines in, in the movie that I, that I remember is, uh, I think it, I'm going to butcher this, but a bad boss sometimes is the best organizer. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, and I think that that is is so true, right? Like it is, it is important that we are united on on one thing, one point, um, you know, so that we can be inclusive and have different people from different backgrounds be able to join the fight. Um, but having a central, uh, well defined um, purpose and and movement, I think is is important in, in building. And I think that that has not changed and it's something that we need to remember um, while, we, while we continue to, to build. Yes, thank you. Debbie. Um, one thought I had about that question is that if there is a big wave of social upheaval mm -hmm. and you see it coming, catch that wave and ride it as fast and hard as you can because mm -hmm. you don't know when the next one's coming you can't really make it the best you can do is ride it and see what you can get out of it and I think there's so many similarities between the 70s when I came into clerical work and I came into my political work um, and today um, that you know by the mid 80s had had died down just the the fervor of the anti-vietnam war movement the women's movement coming off the civil rights movement and so i would say we are in a wave like that 
Um, we have disgraced president now. We had a disgraced president then. Um, that we have some um, economic upheaval uh, right now coming off of the COVID in particular. Um, and uh, so there is just so much disruption going on and this is the time to move, move, move. Um, and I would, I would say that. Thank you, I agree. Mm -hmm. So looking, looking at your, the organizing work that, and, and the way it was approached in uh, with nine to five, um, what, what, what other tools can you take from it? What other lessons can you take from it? I think one of the, the things that I thought was, was awesome was this concept of uh, skill sharing and creating like these, you know, just basic skills that you could use to be an organizer, which is what, what we do now, um, but how they have been the same and how they've evolved, um, especially now with you know, technology and, and the way that, that um, the world has, has moved. Um, but there are things that, you know, obviously have been, um, that have changed, like we just spoke about, but there are things that remain the same um, that we need to continue to organize around, right? Like um, the pay disparities between men and women are still ridiculous and things that we need to be organizing about. Um, and those are things that we've been, uh, that, that were in this film and, and were very much, uh, Okay. That we we need to pull from, I think. Okay. Yeah, I would second that. I think that really a lot of the craft of organizing is the same. Mm -hmm. um, the um, open the door, take people in where they are, don't use language or have expectations about where people are going to be when they come in, um, but bring them in. Um, I, um, make things accessible, uh, let people be active where their comfort zone is. And then once they get the jazz, um, as Carol Sims said in the movie, uh, they're going to want to do more and more. So I feel like that. Um, I, I had the experience uh, this fall of, of working on um, some political campaign up in um, the presidential in Michigan uh, through texting. And I got a whole training about, we're gonna do relational organizing. And I was like, that's a thing? That is what organizing is. And I just feel like th that we have different technology to be able to use it, but the very basic humanity of connecting with people, uh, making it fun, making it challenging, making it interesting um, in order to make change. Um, there's so many of that. And the jazz, which is the, the fun, the camaraderie, the um, being able to learn new things and really flex your skills, all of that is just essential, uh, I think, to any good organizing. Um, and I also think that the issues of race and class as well as gender um, and making sure that you understand how central that is to building organization, um, that is something that has not changed. That was a stunning moment in the film uh, when the sister said, do you, do you work with them? Do you have lunch with them? Do you play with their children? You know, how do you make that connection? So uh, I, I thank you. I'm gonna quit rattling my paper now. I'm gonna go to the questions from the audience. Uh, so the first one is, given what's happened to women during this pandemic, what kind of organizing is happening to make changes? Yeah, so some of the, the organizing that we have been doing um, with Working America has been very much centered around information, getting information out to people. Um, I feel like in the... Uh, in the pandemic, folks have been feeling, or especially in the beginning, there was a lot of, you know, nurses and and folks that felt very much like there was nothing, nothing that they knew, right? Um, nothing that they could do about it. And so we we did some some campaigning around uh, reaching out, uh, you know, whether it be just well-being, how you doing, how you're holding up. Um, I think things like that were uh, was very important. And then 
can shape how we respond to it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the approach that we have been uh, taking and, and moving from as far as organizing folks during this time. Okay. It's really the, the th three, uh, three of the uh, jobs that were deemed essential are work done by women. And I say, it's what we've always known. Women's work is essential. So uh, Debbie, I have a question I'm going to give to you. Uh, are the senior activists doing any work with the Fight for 15 movement? Are any senior activists doing work? <laughs> um, well, some of the seniors are still working as organizers uh, in Fight for 15 land, um, but a lot of us are just showing up when, uh, when, when we're asked. Um, and uh, it is so exciting what is going on um, uh, among uh, minimum wage and low wage workers um, striking and fighting um, for change. And, um, you know, there's a lot that we can do politically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the $15 an hour that is being introduced right now in Congress. Um, so, so those of us who are seniors and know how to be political activists, there's plenty we can do. Um, we, um, as you can see in the movie, we show up at rallies, um, uh, have even done that uh, in COVID times, all masked up um, and a little far away, um, but there's a ton to be done. Uh, and, uh, but, but we are not really the developers of the strategy. We are being led um, by a younger generation. And I'm happy to pass the baton. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding, Angel. Did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that that's great. That's exactly um, how it how it needs to go, right? Um, like you said, standing standing on on the shoulders of of women that started this, and and just learning and growing and developing strategy, right? And as it changes and evolving, that's the thing that's important is evolution, right? Absolutely, and, mm -hmm. and we can talk about social media and all that plays into it. So here's the next <laughs> question. Uh, there's still workplace sexual discrimination and bullying. Uh, what's the best way to stop women bullying other women on the job? Best way to stop women bullying other women on the job? Let's take the mm -hmm. first crack at that. <laughs> think about it for a moment. Well, it's not something that I've actually spent um much time on, because it's not something that's come at me very much in my life. But I would say it's like any other um, workplace problem is that you have to find allies um, and that the collective is the answer. Um, and so um, if one woman is bullying another woman, she's probably bullying others as well. And I just think that you've got to find allies where you can and develop a strategy with them uh, to take it on. And that's just sort of the first basic. I don't know, Angel. Angel and I have worked in very different kinds of places. Um, uh, so, you know, in uh, clerical workforce, there's one thing and uh, the kinds of places you've worked and you've organized are different. Yeah, I would say that um, just like any type of, of bullying, right? Um, it it is something that uh, we can't com completely say that we have a, a strategy to eliminate, right? Um, I think that there are tools in our tool belt that we can use. Um, I think knowing um, the, the company that you're working for and the policies that they uh, claim to uphold and, and making sure that those are well-versed and spoken about early and often. Um, I think um, knowing who to go to when things are like the, things are happening. Um, I think it falls heavily on leadership um, of any organization to to kind of set the culture for that type of thing. Um, so uh, because of uh, the the changes that have uh, that we've been that I'm now um, experiencing and, and being able the privilege to experience, um, there are a lot of women in um, positions of leadership and being able to. Uh, to understand like, okay, that is who I talk to if I'm experiencing this from this, uh, this group of people. I think sometimes when it's fuzzy and the hierarchy is fuzzy, you're like, okay, I don't even know who that person's boss is or who I should be talking to about certain things. So making sure that everybody along um, the entire organization understands that I think is, is a, a, a good step. 
Um, it's about the infrastructure that you build within an organization and, and um, how much people know it um, to be able to, to combat stuff like that. And I'm a labor educator, so I always think you need to be having classes. You need to be doing training. You have to have information available, readily available for people to access. Yep. Um, so here's the next question from our audience. Have you been following the organizing efforts of Amazon in Alabama? And what are your thoughts? Yes. Speaking of uh, what something that's rising up from this pandemic and from this last administration and, the, and women and people of color and the Black Lives Matter movement, Amazon is organizing. What do you think? Yeah, it's a big warehouse down in Alabama and the ballots are going out. And I am looking forward to a win from them by the uh, time they count those ballots in March. Uh, you know, the employers tried every way it knows how to avoid the, they didn't want a mail ballot they wanted to make people come in in person i mean just every trick in the book these employers will use but uh, these workers have organized they are going to have their vote they're going to do it by mail um, and i'm excited to see what's going to come from that because uh, the rest of the country and the rest of the world can take a lot of um, optimism if these workers in alabama stand up um, and we're going to have to help them get that first contract. You can see um, from the movie that getting the first contract is not always easy. Um, so they got to keep organizing past that first win. And there might be ways we can, as, as consumers, can help. And we won't talk about defeats because we got on that in our chat. Angel, you want to address this? <laughs> I, I, uh, I think that's a Debbie's right on point. Um, the only thing I would add to that is it's right on time. I mean, mm -hmm. it is right on time. It's right on time. So next question. Do you think nine to five was more creative because it was a grassroots women worker led movement rather than a project undertaken by an established union? What was that impact of having grassroots women worker led rather than the top down hierarchical structures that we know today? Uh, Debbie, yes. you say about that? <laughs> <laughs> yes okay i yep. think i think that when things are creative i mean when things are grassroots they will be more creative they're you know they will be more reflective of the people who are organizing um and uh yes i definitely think so i know that uh angel you said that when you started organizing the first thing you asked people is what is important to you, mm -hmm. right? And in that, in that, in that aspect of getting people where they are right now. Yep. And so you found that, that that's that's working with grassroots, and that that's and people are being creative in that respect. I think that that's what drives the creativity, right? Um, it is one way to. I mean, you you never want to come to a conversation with your mind made up because that's not a conversation anymore. You're you're really just trying to convince somebody at that point, which nobody likes to feel convinced or um you know mm -hmm. sold on something um so yes what knowing what is important to the to the folks that you're organizing and being um flexible in that way i think is is what is uh what makes it powerful and I, i'm not i can't speak for for the nine to five movement but i think that that is something that i find to be so inspirational is that it came from what it was trying to change right so like it cannot get more raw and more organic and more real than that and that's why we have to you know, it's, it's, it's about learning from that and, and growing from that. Raw, well, real, and organic. Thank you, sister. I am so <laughs> there. So this is a question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take to you first, uh, Angel, uh, because you're doing it right now. Uh, well, here's workers are struggling to build relationships because of the pandemic. There is no way to go to have lunch or grab coffee s safely. So what tips do you want to, can you give folks to keep organizing under this quarantine? And all about media. all about the technology the social media the zoom calls after zoom call you know um that is that is one of the things that i think has has um where we have to evolve right um we're not able to to do the meetup to you know sign the paper petitions anymore right or for right now right. Um, but we can still do these things through text messages through emails through video chats through phone calls um i think that that's also a really important thing because I think we can kind of overcorrect sometimes where it's like, okay, I can't see you. So I'm just going to 
send you this email and I'll keep up with you in email, but that also kind of, we lose something there. So you got to know when to pick up the phone, when to, when to have a video call, when to see someone's face, check in with them, see how they're doing. It's still very much, um, you know, a, a way to, to build relationships is, is through the, this fabulous technology that we have um, readily available to most of us, even on our cell phones. Absolutely. And, and certainly the next generation I find is much more adept at it. And that's where they're getting the information from. And so in, in the coalition labor union, when we're training everybody on zoom, it's like, it's not just, because this isn't going to be over, but when the pandemic is over, this is a tool that we can still use. Right. Yep. David, did you want to add anything to that? Cause I'm, I'm no, that's good. So some the question is, this is a basic question. Are most unions still so dominated by men? <laughs> <laughs> it could be yes or no, but you could go on about it. At least you know the answer to that. Why don't you tell us? <laughs> we know. Yes, it is still. It is still. <laughs> right? Um, and, and what does that mean in terms of organizing and, and, what, and the work that we're doing? I mean, not all unions are. And I think if you look at the unions that the that have been really been taking incredible action um, this year in the pandemic the years before uh, the teachers in all of those red states that have been so militant um, the healthcare workers um, who are insisting um, on on their rights um, this year and ongoing um, there are many unions that are that are pre predominantly women workforces and that are led by women, um, but there's still a lot of union of, out there that are not. The next uh, AFL-CIO convention is going to be very interesting. <laughs> and who, do you want to add anything to this? I mean, it's the takeover, right? <laughs> I, I mean, it about how it's important that the folks that are being worked a seat at the table and are a part of these conversations and it changes the strategy when the folks that are in charge of, of things um, know what it's like. And so um, it's only, I, I think it, it is, from my perspective, it is diversifying where because of movements like the nine to five movement where we are, uh, you know, churning out these strong uh, women leaders and and it's, uh, it's only a matter of time before they're it, it balances itself out. Okay, so I see, I see a question in the chat room about Black Lives Matter, but I'm not sure, uh, but because there are more, and I know we're, we're running uh, uh, low on time. So let me, let me go to the next one. I'm a member of Philly Clue. Hello, Philly Clue. Uh, I was a Lori girl temp in New York in the 70s and could have used nine to five. Uh, people have become so used to Zoom that, la that labor movements should take advantage of that to turn to Zoom we're organizing in a major way. Okay, that's, that's, that's a statement, right? Okay. Uh, teachers, flight attendants, I'm going to scroll down, miss anything. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Uh, we have an organizing committee right now comprised of all women, and they're concerned about not being inclusive or diverse right now in their efforts. I told them that will come in time, but I'm curious, what is your advice? What would be your advice to them? Because the workforce is not all women but their committee is? Good question. That, that's what I think their question is. <laughs> we can't get to the um, we can ask that. Um, so I think you have to be intentional about this and that you need to do the work until you have a leadership among who you're organizing that reflects the membership. Um, and, uh, so if that means you have to do very particular outreach uh, to get some men involved, then you've got to come up with a strategy to do that. Um, you know, when we organize in the union, you have to worry about what shift people are on, uh, different job titles, as well as demographic um, things around race and gender. Um, so if it's all women starting, that's a very good start. Um, but then you have to be really particular about making sure you're going out and reaching out to people who, for whatever reason, aren't feeling welcome or inspired, um, and listening's a very good start. 
uh, to figuring out what it is uh, that will bring them in. How about you? What do you think, Angel? I think that um, the fact that there is already a, a recognition and an acknowledgement that you need to diversify is the first step, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, whenever trying to create a inclusive, diverse environment, it is about being okay with the uncomfortableness sometimes. And kind of like what Debbie was saying, like going out of the way um, to figure out ways to, to be inclusive. So um, figure out what you've uh, been trying to stay away from and do that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we're going to wrap up here real quick. My last question, because this is the question that you said, Angel, that this is the first thing you ask somebody when you're organizing is what is important to you? What is important to you, Angel, right now? Debbie, what's important to you? Well, I would say what's important to me right now um, is kind of piggybacking off of what uh, the last question was. And that is very much staying intentional with the way that I organize and the way that I show up um, for the communities that I'm advocating for. Um, making sure that I'm also um, being okay with the uncomfortableness and being inclusive, right? Um, mm -hmm. Being intentional about um, uniting all people, all women, you know, trans women, women of color, um, the LGBT community, um, immigrants, everybody. Um, and sometimes it's hard to, to even be like, uh, you know, some, some of the folks who don't think the way that I do in figuring out how we can find common ground and, and unite to, to help us all in the end. Um, so I think that's what's important to me when we're in this very polarized environment, right? Um, especially coming off of uh, a administration that felt so alienating to a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. it can, you can start um, putting up your own walls and becoming part of the problem. Um, and so it's important to me to recognize when I'm doing that, when I see a, 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 something that makes me put my walls up and think, why am I doing this right now? What could I do to change this right now? And how can I take note of it so I can help other people do the same? Thank you. Self-reflection. Debbie, what's important to you? I think it's important to keep on keeping on. Um, that there are always going to be setbacks. There's always going to be frustrations. There's going to be outrages. Um, and that so building community, investing in people, particularly focusing on people who are different mm -hmm. than I am um, and learning um, and reaching out there and never stopping doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the, trusting the wisdom of the group if the group is diverse enough. Um, and um, really keeping hope alive um, and keeping the jazz alive because uh, I think those things are what's going to keep bringing the energy forward. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank both of you. Uh, I want to I wanna really appreciate you for uh, sharing and for the good questions we got. Uh, tonight's screening was presented by the D.C. Labor Film Fest, the Coalition of Labor Union Women, the Labor Heritage Foundation, and the Rochester Labor Film Series. The D.C. Labor Fest is sponsored by American Income Life. I'd like to thank our techie, Evan. Thank you very much. Uh, Evan Papp. Chris Garlock, of course, the OGG, and special thanks to Karen Nussbaum for helping put this panel together. Bless her heart. She's still working, too. Um, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. And that was Ella Baker's words. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. And so the work, we know what the work is, and we know the work that we have been called to do. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Angel. Thank you all very much for sharing your knowledge. But one more thing. You and Debbie, and then I'm gonna give you last word, Angel. Okay. I was actually gonna serve it up to Angel because Karen Nussbaum at the end of the movie asked, what happens to consciousness? Mm. Um, and I wanted to toss that over to Angel, who I think um, has some wisdom to share around that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that, um... Thank you for that. And Karen is uh, near and dear to me. She has inspired me um, to, to do all the work that I do, especially within Working America. Um, and I, I think that this question about what happens to consciousness is, is uh, summed up in this, in this proverb, this Mexican proverb that says, they tried to bury us and they didn't know we were seeds. And I think that that is 
that is hits the nail on the head, right? Like we might take a loss. We might, uh, you know, do all of this build up to, to, to take a loss and not get what we wanted maybe from, from the organizing efforts, but that doesn't, that doesn't stop there. It's still there and it's still growing. And the next opportunity, it's going to pick right back up where it needed to. And we see it happening now. Right. So. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, family. Thank you, siblings, <laughs> comrades, all of you who tuned in. I, I know there people from around the world. I saw people from Australia and the UK and uh, there was somebody from South America, I think, too. So uh, thank you. We will see you next time. Everybody stay safe, stay well, and solidarity forever. Listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear their voices still calling from across the years. And they're crying across the ocean, they're crying across the land, and they will until we all come to understand. None of us are free.